Yeah, so I think uh, we can start. It's, it's 11.15 already. So uh, welcome all. Uh, thank you for coming for my talk, uh, Building the Cloud Ecosystem. Uh, I mean, from the name, it's, it's a huge topic. Like, you could have a whole conference of developers, architects coming and just talking about how ecosystems should look, especially clouds. And uh, when I'm talking about an ecosystem, uh, we want to design something that will solve problems. So the use cases are large. Uh, as we all know, we have been seeing all the presentations that are happening. People are interested. People want to solve real world problems, enterprise problems. And there is a valid need for a cloud ecosystem that can actually make use of technologies, uh, not re do reinvention of work and solve their use cases at the same time. Uh, I'll try to cover this up in uh, 35 minutes. Uh, we'll keep a question answer around at the end of the presentation for like five to 10 minutes uh, so we can talk about it. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention here is uh, more than how we'll build the ecosystem, uh, something that I want you guys to take more from this is why build an ecosystem. like. We want to focus more on why do we want to build, invest in these technologies rather than, yes, also do consider once we have figured out that, yes, we do have a valid use case, we do have a business case for going ahead and building such a system, then go ahead and find it out. Uh, so my name is uh, Chinmay. Uh, briefly about the cloud platform engineering at Semantic. Uh, so we are, a, we are building a consolidated pl cloud platform uh, for our customers, internal customers. It's a private offering right now. And this is to facilitate development of all semantic products and services internally. Uh, we are growing. Uh, in the next, say, a year or so, our data center footprint for, for our internal cloud is also going to grow. Uh, something about myself, I have been in the cloud space, uh, especially with OpenStack, for like three years now. Uh, I had Hadoop experience as well, uh, so a lot of distributed computing background, and I'm an open source enthusiast. I mean, that's some of the reason why we are all here. Open source is uh, the way to go. Uh, uh, setting uh, the agenda straight, so I'll be talking a little bit about the technology, three majorly, which is Docker, Kubernetes, and Alexis. It is a very hot topic right now, but I will give like an honest opinion of what I feel these technologies are. Uh, why use them? Uh, one of the main topics that I want to cover here is some of the semantic use cases that actually require these technologies, if I may say. Uh, our evaluation of these technologies, like what is it that we got from when we looked at these technologies, what is it that we saw? Uh, and then what makes an ecosystem and building the ecosystem? This is where I'll be giving out a few guidelines, uh, three ecosystems that we have architected and Work is still going on, on uh, getting these out. A summary in the future work and then question and answers. Uh, so going ahead into what is Kubernetes, Alexis, uh, Docker, uh, it's not like a deep dive, but just a know-how. So just by raise of hands, how many of you are using Docker in their companies right now? And these are in production environments. And about Kubernetes? That's interesting. So few points about what Docker containers are for those who may know, those who may not. Uh, Docker containers ideally is a really good platform for running applications outside of on containers. Uh, it runs a stripped down version, minimal OS. Uh, when I say this, uh, initially Docker was started as a single application. So next point being is uh, services, demons, libraries added if only needed. What this means is that it started, so it runs out of AUFS, and uh, it has a core layer. The process itself is the init, uh, init D process. Uh, a single application use uh, doesn't have uh, a proper init, uh, doesn't have cron, uh, doesn't have uh, syslog ng, if you may know. Uh, starts with a minimal one. Uh, services, demons, and libraries can be added if needed, so you can add, so it's not needed, you need a syslog ng, because Docker has Docker logs, so you could might as well have your outputs go down to that log and then have it put into any log stash or any Kibana kind of a service. Single application use, but not anymore. 
uh, there have been a lot of blog posts about people trying to fight between uh, is Docker only used if you have a single application use case or can I run multiple applications in the same container? There are ways that you can run multiple applications. Uh, you can have a system D, a supervisor D process which runs in as you're in it and then can manage uh, process uptimes. Uh, make sure if a process goes down, restarts it and stuff. So there are ways to run multiple applications on a Docker container right now. Based on AUFS, as I just said, uh, that's the advanced multi-layer unif uh, unification file system. So basically, everything is a layer in Docker. So basically, all the layers are read-only of an OS. And whatever you write, whatever you edit, like you change a MySQL version or you do some code change on top. It's done on a write-only layer, which is on top. And once you do a Docker commit, it just creates a new image out of it. So at the end, you end up with these layers that have all the changes in it. Uh, makes containers easy to use. So this point is more in relation to also later on, there'll be comparisons with LXEs. Uh, there are a lot of people who want Docker. There are a lot of people who, says, who say, I already have LXE support. Why do I need Docker? So from my perspective, uh, Docker has made containers very easy to use. Docker has a good client. It has a good CLI system, which developers will find very, personally being a developer, will find very easy to pick up these uh, command line tools that they have, uh, it's inst uh, instructions that they have. So that is one point. Uh, quickly going into Kubernetes, because we already talked about Docker. Uh, it's a cluster management for applications. So this goes. From my perspective, a, a level above uh, where Docker is, where it goes more into an orchestration of uh, containers. Grouping containers in pods and labels. So it's a very important concept uh, called as pods, uh, where you can group, you can group uh, these special containers uh, which form your application. And uh, these can be deployed as a group called as pods. And you can label these pods. So basically, these pods could be deployed around uh, around machines in your data center. And you can figure out based on the labels that you have given to them. So it's a very, very good way of cluster management. Again, you can form these clusters of, apl of, of application servers and then have them uh, have applications deployed on them. Uh, declarative primitives from maintaining desired state. Uh, there is certain description that you can make sure that have an, uh, an application requires certain set of components to be up for that application to be running. So those kinds of primitives. Self-healing mechanisms, so these are more in terms of uh, rescheduling or restarting containers if it goes down. Uh, maybe even copy it over from one location to another. So it provides very powerful mechanism to orchestrate containers, uh, keeping your application in mind. Talking a little bit about Linux containers itself, because uh, Docker initially did start with uh, using LXE itself. Uh, now they have lib containers, obviously, if uh, you guys might be knowing. So Linux container uh, kernel containment uh, uses kernel namespaces. As we all know, it's a, it has been around for some time now. Uh, the user namespace uh, came around uh, at a later stage. Uh, so initially, it started with the PID mount network namespaces. Use of C groups uh, to make to have access control on all the resources, memory as such, and resource isolation for applications. So this is basically where we use virtual box, uh, virtual machines right now. So it's it gives you the ability to containize or isolate your resources for a particular app application's use. So. So having having done that, let's just go through some of the why uh, use these technologies. So this will go more into some of the semantics use cases as well, because uh, we since we are building a, a big platform for all our internal services, we need to make sure we keep everyone happy. Uh, when I say everyone happy, solve their use cases. So there are use cases all the way from people wanting VMs, uh, people wanting containers. Uh, let's let's just take a look at some of them, right? Uh, so continuous deployment, I think this is one. So I was just in a talk before uh, about CERN, uh, where he was talking about uh, all the big things that they're trying to do, the, all the physics problems that they're solving. But I think at the baseline of it was 
one thing, uh, trying to enable scientists, trying to enable developers, trying to enable whoever is trying to build the product that your company is for, like what your business runs on. So I think this is one use case. It's not just for semantic, but I think everyone wants, everyone wants that fancy one button click that helps a developer deploy his code into staging and right into production. So provide standardized environments. Uh, this is where I think containers help a lot. Uh, you want the same environment to be used by all developers in your team or all scientists in your, in, in your CERN lab or whatever. Seamless deployment packaging across platforms. You have multiple cloud deployments. Uh, you will have multiple staging environments. You have QAs. You want to be able to reduce the time required for running something on from like a developer's laptop to something that runs on a QA box where the QAs run, uh, you have something in staging which is pre-prod and then you run into production. So you want to minimize this. So for that, you need a sim seamless deployment and packaging across platforms that we have. And then the test ones deploy many model. So to be able to guarantee that if you were to test something in one particular environment, that if this code now goes into like 10 different data centers that you have already deployed, well, it will run there. So it's like, you test it in one environment, and you don't have to test it 10 times again to deploy it in 10 different data centers. So that's more of a point. So this is one thing we really want. The next is uh, version upgrades. So with uh, the whole OpenStack going with a six monthly release cycle, uh, upgrades is something that is very important because the thing is people have started using, we, we started using uh, since Havana right now in uh, OpenStack. I think even before there was, I think it's a small, POC with Grizzly, but upgrading is can be a hassle, especially when your scale grows, when you have many data centers, it you have to be up and the, the whole thing of staying on the on the master, on the on the master branch, it requires you to have a good amount of CI C D and then a, a, a policy figured out to how you will do upgrades. So different versions of applications deployed on a single node. So this would I would like to use this in terms of a control plane upgrade. Like, so there are many ways of doing upgrades of control planes. You can do an in-place control plane upgrade. You can have a parallel control plane setup, or you could use containers. What you could do is on the same host, which is running, say, your Havana NOAA scheduler service. If that is containerized, you can have an ice house container with ice house code base in it, sitting in the same host, and then you could do version switching between these on the day of the upgrade. So s seamless switching between containers and minimizing downtime. So to be able to make sure that the switching between and the whole upgrade process doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, ease of rollbacks during deployment failure. Uh, this is also another thing. If you have two containers sitting on the same machine, you'll be able to seamlessly do a rollback. So version upgrades is a very good use case that we are looking forward to solve. Uh, performance intensive applications. Uh, in semantic, there are various applications that we see. Few require are very data in intensive. Few are CPU intensive, require a lot of data crunching and stuff. So we want to make sure our performances are near bare metal speeds. Uh, faster boot up times, which again goes to comparison between VMs and containers. So I mean, these use cases, I think you might be getting a general feel that you require everything. You require VMs for some things. You require containers for th some things. You would require even bare metal nodes for some, some of these use cases. Uh, resource isolation benefits of VMs. So, so I mean, you can see that point two and point three require, so you need resource isolations of VMs, what VMs provide. But at the same time, you need faster boot up time. So your answer is slowly going towards containers. So again, to this point, there have been people in, in the company itself walking up to us and trying to say that you know there, there was this code deployed on one of the machines. And uh, they, had, they, they thought that next day morning when they show up, that the same application set is going to stay as is, untouched. But they realized that someone, some DevOps engineer, someone went at, in, in the night, and then they changed some setting. In, in in the base uh, in the base uh, compute node, and then that destroyed their setting or they lost something on their part. 
so this is something where they wanted like if they can have like a snapshot of something like again going back to docker container right like they were, they were saying that why don't we evaluate docker containers wherein if they had snapshotted their state and they did not care about what happened to the base en base engine or the base uh, compute node if they came back the next day they figured out something had changed they just redeploy the container back in again and then they are uh, it's like they did not find that something had gone amiss so this is one of the use cases that we want to make sure we handle uh, overlays in sdn is another uh, thing wherein we have a use case where we have applications deployed in a vm and they need to talk to applications deployed in bare metal nodes and what is happening is so uh, the sdn solution that we are using so the vrouter setup that it has uh, the vms are sitting in overlay networks and for the vm to talk to a bare metal which is in the underlay network it has all every packet has to go through an external gateway routers and that can get very expensive uh, when the number of packets go up so what we thought instead is that since the bare metal application requires something some performance gains of a bare metal why not use a container there have a overlay network plugged into the container and now you're talking about two machines on the same overlay network talking to each other so that's one of the gains that we'll find in terms of performance when you when we start using containers instead of bare metal nodes for some of our applications uh in case latency on traffic uh some of the other use cases i think so remote failure debugging i don't think we have a immediate need for this uh, but yes it's a very powerful tool to have because you want to know if something goes bad in your production uh, your developers will be able to fix it and the first thing that a developer always ask is can i reproduce this and the answer that you normally give is try to set it up in qa environment so the whole docker containers the whole use of snapshotting of containers and trying to give an exact replica of that environment is like a really useful thing and of course image management so glance is currently helping us uh, with our image management uh, but we need it to be on like a larger scale so there's a lot of images that are getting created uh where can kubernetes help so some of the use cases that i want to talk about with kubernetes itself is uh, so container orchestration and application deployment tools so since this is a very good application level orchestrator a uh, lot of developers can make use of this uh, when i say that it can be used to deploy say small hadoop development clusters or even say open stack clusters for developers to make sure that they can do internal development in uh, manage flex up and flex down requirements and flex the flex down is is a very key concept of cloud because that's what makes things really elastic so trying to use resources when you need and give them away when you don't so flex up flex down is a very important thing uh, that can be there are people who try to write applications on top of heat uh, to make sure that they can do some uh, cluster management and then make sure that if uh, based on telemetry if the user is not there just uh, reprovision them to someone else but then kubernetes solves that for you uh, hadoop and big data use case so this is one uh, big use case in, inside semantic itself because semantic runs a lot of uh, data crunching lot of lot of pattern matching uh, and that is done on our hadoop clusters which are trying to use our open stack infrastructure for uh, iis solution so helping them out is uh, one of a major use case for us and i see a lot of gains uh, where kubernetes can help deploy say like a say like a control cluster like when i say control cluster you can have a job tracker just a small cluster for hadoop spun, spun up on the infrastructure say so you have a tenant uh, a development tenant say for example and then you have say four compute nodes say one of them you can make you can deploy a job tracker task on it you can have task trackers on all the other compute nodes and it's like a small development environment and it can be increased ahead i mean it need not stay at a development level it could go to like a production environment you can actually manage a hadoop cluster using kubernetes maybe if you are running out of if if you are running this out of containers so that's a pretty interesting thought there uh, monitoring and tooling again i think 
even the Kubernetes guys, uh, they say that they're not just container orchestrators. They do much more beyond, which is like stuff like self-healing and stuff. So they are like a lot of monitoring processes that make sure that your containers don't go down. Uh, in the current cloud world with whole OpenStack, you have to come up with an external monitoring service. Uh, what that means is if your VM goes down, there is either a, a, a separate alert that goes on, and then you need to make sure that you fix it. So Kubernetes helps that, so why not leverage something like that if you have container use cases? Uh, so going into the next section is uh, what it's not about in-depth uh, analysis of what these are, but a few call-outs that we think are very important when we want to go forward and building the, the entire ecosystem that solves everything that we just talked about, right? So using OpenStack, so it's, I did not explain OpenStack because obviously we all know what it is here. Uh, what have we got used to? So when we have been using OpenStack for the past one year or one and a half years for now, uh, there are a few things, there are a few good things that we want to carry forward when we try to build our ecosystem. And those are basically tenantizing of resources. So we want resource isolation and we want them to be owned by specific tenants. So it's, it's a very important concept that keeps the OpenStack cloud right now going. It's a very important principle that we want to go take forward in whatever ecosystem we build. Uh, we want token-based secure access to everything. We don't want people to just SSH onto a box and start using it just because it's there. Uh, ecosystem of amazing as a service capabilities, so that's what OpenStack has given us. So the whole notion of any any service that can be that can be looked at as a that can be front-ended by a, a good REST API. Uh, called on a token basis, called on a need per basis, and then it does whatever it needs to do. I, know, I, know, I need not bother about what needs to happen in there. So like Glance takes care, of, takes care of images for me. Like Neutron takes care of networking for me. So we want those capabilities. We want to keep that structure. And of course, virtualization, LXEs, and bare metal. So these are like the three things that we want to take forward, the VMs, uh, containers, and bare metals. Uh, going into a bit of discussion, so again, a lot of uh, blogs about the whole Docker versus LXC, uh, I, I don't want to say a fight, but then why use Docker when you have LXCs, that kind of a conversation. But uh, my personal viewpoint here would be Docker is equivalent to orchestrating LXCs. Uh, templatized way of orchestrating containers. So, uh, a Docker file, from my perspective, is a heat template, a very similar to heat template. You can specify a lot of things uh, in terms of what goes into a container, what kind of process runs on it. Uh, maintaining snapshots of LXC containers in a glance against Docker images. So, this is another. So, we are assuming right now that a, a company or someone has OpenStack, has Glance deployed, and you could have an LXE container using your uh, libvirt LXE driver inside Nova and then snapshot it, have the image saved in Glance. But this system is given to you directly by Docker. So Docker internally just works on this principle of snapshotting layers. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting thought there. And a little bit more about this is, so LXE containers can be nested. Uh, AUFS is nice to, uh, nice to have, but is it needed? Like, You can have the AUFS way of doing things, uh, wherein you layer on, you have copy on write. Uh, but there are a few advantages, disadvantages. I'm not sure if the Docker community has already worked on it, but there was recently a, a bug that uh, went through, and then like you run into a lot of layers. So if you would like to, in say, like layer say 10, you were to install one version of MySQL, uh, and then later on you were you try to do another uh, version of, or you do an upgrade, you still have the bunch of layers that are there. So there is like a set limit on which you can. So your size of the image can grow. So you don't want that to be happening. So it's not always necessary. You would want an AUFS kind of a, of a, of a solution. Uh, this is another thing. So the configuration drift. Uh, so Puppet to manage configuration. So would you want your, uh, your configuration management to be done by Puppet when you go into a container? So for that, you would want a, a classic LXE container, which is a standard and it's already always there. And then you have Puppet to manage configuration inside it or Docker diff would do everything and then 
any state that needs to be maintained can be done in a volume. Uh, using containers with Docker is more user friendly, so I think we have just covered this point before. So these are some of the things that we kept in mind uh, before going forward with uh, what we want to do. And then technology cost is also a, a very important thing. Uh, you just don't want to go on adding technology stacks after stacks because it requires a certain amount of cost. It goes through a lot of uh, monitoring. It has you have put you have to put tooling and stuff around it. So there is a certain amount of cost that goes into it. Uh, making it user aware and user friendly. Like I can put in, throw in a Kubernetes stack uh, and then just ask my developers that you start using this. It's not going to be that easy at the start. So you need to make sure that this happens when you're choosing a technology. Uh, impact to availability and will it scale out? So availability is another thing that you need to make sure it's taken care of. Like when you spin up a Kubernetes cluster, you need to make sure that the cluster stays up. Uh, same with OpenStack. So these are some of the very learned cost uh, parameters that you need to make sure that you are making uh, note of. Will it be how will it be monitored? Like the current setup that you have for monitoring your OpenStack cluster would be the same to monitor, say, for your Kubernetes cluster. Would it be same for monitoring your uh, Docker uh, installations. So there is a lot of things that go in, and then security impact. So security impact is very uh, crucial when you talk about VMs or when you talk about containers, the whole uh, thing of NOAA conductors, where we want to make sure that people don't have access to the database directly from the compute nodes. So these are all security-related stuff, uh, uh, even about containers, like right before uh, user namespaces. Uh, if, if I'm a root inside a, uh, inside a container, I might even get access as a root inside the host. So some of those things uh, need to be made sure before you embrace any technology. Uh, very, very, very key points uh, that we need to make sure. So what makes an ecosystem, right? Uh, some of the points that I want to talk, so the normal definition is a, a biological community of interactive organisms and physical environments. Uh, every component serves a distinguished purpose and solves a use case uniquely. So this again goes back to the as a service point that we had that you need to make sure that uh, you only add something when it has some value, a, a uniquely distinguished value. Uh, coexistence without interaction, if it serves the purpose, it's not necessarily to make two technologies talk to each other. If they are solving your use cases, staying alone, it is completely fine to run them different. If if you there is no way to figure out how to run. Kubernetes with heat or with OpenStack, then it's fine. You can have a separate uh, infrastructure that's running your Kubernetes cluster and a separate infrastructure that is running your OpenStack cluster. Um, and harnessing all the goodness together. And OpenStack is a perfect example of an ecosystem which is already in place. Uh, so, so some of the, so, so as I said, mentioned before, so I'm going to talk about three uh, designs that we came up with and we are currently working on them based on which one gets our use cases solved immediately. So the first one that we trying to go through is with Murano and Heat. Uh, Murano is, uh, is a, you could even call it as it's doing a lot of workflow related and application level orchestrator. Uh, so it can get us integration with he Keystone. So that solves our tenantizing of resources. Uh, application catalog for defining complex workflows. So it has a concept of an application catalog wherein you have these application resources that can be reused by developers. So there is a whole description that you can provide as to what goes into running an application, what is required to deploy it, what is required to keep, what is, deploy, what is required to describe its up availability. So Something similar to say, like my application requires, say it's going to require two uh, MySQL instances, it's going to require one, uh, say, a web server, one, say, backend node. So you can specify that, yes, if one MySQL server goes down, make sure that you spin up another one or just make an alert that the application cannot run. Auto scaling and self healing features are there inside Murano, uh, very similar to Kubernetes. Uh, Integrated, U it has a UI uh, that uh, is integrated with Horizon, so we try to test that out as well. And then, obviously, it has an OpenStack project development lifecycle, which we can make use of. Uh, the, the whole ecosystem would generally look like this, so keeping in mind our use cases, where we want to solve 
having VMs, having uh, containers uh, would be this. So we would want Keystone uh, to be authenticating with Murano itself. And then the Murano API is what something will feed the application templates to. Uh, Murano will be talking to Heat. Uh, and then we can have container templates specified directly through Heat also. So no one says that you can't use Heat directly anymore. And then a Docker plugin, which the Heat uh, ecosystem already has right now, can be used to orchestrate VMs and containers. And then Murano itself then can have uh, the RabbitMQ to talk to the Murano agent to make sure the correct applications are deployed on those, either a VM or a container. So this is something that Murano we have tested out with. But containers, uh, we are still in the process of making sure if the Murano agent can be put inside a container itself. And this container obviously can be a Docker container uh, with the right base image setup. So if it's, it's not be, should not be a single application Docker container. Uh, this is another thing that we need to test out. Uh, if, if we can put something inside a bare metal node itself, if, can, if we can install the Murano agent inside this and then have Murano uh, kind of know what applications are running inside. Uh, so this is one very realistic approach that we are currently investigating inside our uh, inside Semantic. So containers as a service, so this is the whole Magnum project. So. So I do not want to speak a lot about this, but then it's very promising, at least for me. Uh, there have been a lot of discussions about this, uh, whether to take this forward and how to. I think on Thursday, there will be a design session talking about it. So make sure you attend to, to have your use cases in it. So clusters can be isolated per tenant domain again, uh, exposes its own CLI and maybe a scheduling logic. So it requires Gantt. Uh, unless and until Gantt comes into play, I don't know what's the plan for scheduling logic inside it. And use of aggregates to isolate computes for container use cases. This is uh, one of uh, what I want to propose to the to the Magnum community. Easier integration. So let's take a look at uh, the diagram itself, right? So again, the same thing. So we want heat to be on top. So I think one of the points that I missed on this slide was uh, Easier integration, but should it orchestrate? So container as a service will solve some of the use cases, like trying to get your containers into the container as a service uh, service. But then should, do you want it to orchestrate? So you're going to miss all the goodness of the orchestration of Murano and the Kubernetes, which is coming up in the third uh, diagram. But in this case, you so I've just kept a heat module on top, uh, which will actually do some sort of orchestration. You can even put. Murano on top of this, uh, I'm not sure if you will require some special things for Heat to talk to uh, Container as a Service directly. But then again, the same thing being as GAN scheduler, uh, this is still not completely in, in, in practice. Uh, and again, same with compute nodes, having VMs, uh, having LXC containers. If Container as a Service were to be, my recommendation for them would be to have solve both. They have the LXC driver and the Docker driver as well. And then there is a there is one small recommendation that I have is of a resource pool scheduler wherein what can happen is through heat you would want Nova to till till the time GAN scheduler comes into play this is so you can have Nova API dedicate compute nodes just for container use cases and then using a, a special API inside containers provide this set of computes to the container as a service and it can do resource scheduling within that pool of computes. So not sure if this will get implemented, but this solution is more of like in like a really research research phase. So let's see what happens with this. And then this is uh, the more realistic and maybe another similar to Murano where we can actually do some testing inside this so using heat and heat to provision VMs uh, that run Kubernetes components. Uh, integration with Keystone uh, Docker driver for heat. Uh, template categorization, VMs and containers, looking at the image. Uh, so in this model, so even talking back about the Hadoop use case that we had initially, right? So this kind of solves that problem. So wherein you have uh, heat, which is doing a central orchestration. And you have the Kubernetes cluster template. You have Docker container template and OpenStack VM template. So I'll talk about this plugin later. It's not there yet, uh, but maybe something that we can contribute. Uh, what this means is uh, when 
say let's talk about the kubernetes example right so when you were to set up a kubernetes cluster inside my compute nodes so say for example there is a tenant say in in, in our case there is a hadoop tenant who wants to have like a small hadoop cluster set up inside so you can have a tenant spin up a kubernetes comp so the kubernetes system would require the master components so this is like a very high level thing and then it would require the minions which would which will actually run the pods so you can have heat templates written so that it can spin up these vms and these could be vms or these could be bare metal so it could be containers inside which a kubernetes master process can be run uh, there are different ways actually to do this uh, i think the core os guys have come up with uh, a, a good solution for this wherein you can have i think the etcd uh, daemon which rec which makes sure that when minions are added they get added back into kubernetes cluster but th the the reason for the kubernetes plugin was that if later tomorrow in this system you were to add one more compute node if you were to add a minion to that system how would the master get to know that it has so there are various ways of doing it a kubernetes plugin driver which can talk directly to the uh, to the system which is installed to make sure that when new minions are added they get added to this uh, system and then you can have the rest of the use cases also solved so you can have say if you don't want kubernetes to manage your docker daemons docker containers for some reason you could have heat do directly through the docker plugin so again i think the 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 so some of the similar technologies as i just mentioned so core os and et uh, cd system d fleet is doing a good uh, job at that so we are trying to evaluate that as well Uh, OpenShift and Crowbar, uh, very similar. Mesosphere, running on top of Apache Mesos, it's doing very similar things. And Cola is also one. So to talk about things, right? So I think we touched about a lot of technologies here. And again, as at the start of the talk, when I said it's not just about how, but also why, uh, there are five different ways of solving a problem. uh always you there's no one single thing that you want to put your point on you can write blogs hate blogs about not liking one technology not trying to say that yes lx is the way to go i don't need docker anymore i would want to put a, a a viewpoint on this is if it solves the problem then use it uh it's not about technology is not about it doesn't get you to where you have it's just an enabler so if you can find the right stack for you if you can find the right ecosystem keeping in mind that all the costs are taken care of and if it solves your use cases then that's the way to go uh, some guidelines to keep in mind again of what i just said so use cases comes first solution follows don't come up with a technology and then try to find a use case for it so make sure that you have a list of all use cases inside your uh, organization well defined rest apis are cool when integrating services so each technology choice that you make uh, i would say make sure that it is front ended by a cube like by a very clear rest api services which you can call again the point being is you want services to make sure that they do some use case solve some use case uniquely uh, technologies are better used separately sometimes that's again one point and operational and security costs of running such an ecosystem so like uh, i mean i i need not explain this uh, not to reinvent the wheel again there are a lot of people trying to do a lot of things like i see kubernetes doing very similar things to what core cube is doing to what uh, you can enable with something like murano to what you can do with apache mesos with mesosphere uh, choices is still with you guys but then make sure that when you do evaluations like the three choices that we have we have narrowed down it from like a huge range of choices so we want to make sure again the goodness slide that we went through what have we got used to and what is it that we want to carry forward when we are doing going to do our technology choices and usability aspect yes keep it simple uh, make sure that your developers do want to use what you have built there's no point building something that people are not going to use or find it very difficult to start using some of the future work uh, that we want to work on right now after having talked about this is the performance analysis of this i know i had a point on the summary that i was going to talk but we did not have enough time to come up with this so maybe in the next 6 months we'll have a complete performance analysis picture uh, specific driver development some of the driver developments that i just 
pointed out there, so we might want to do those, like even the container as a service project, we might look at it and try to provide some help in that. And uh, services deployed and managed at a regional and a global level. So we don't want to be at a one data center at a time. We want to make sure that services can be run at a regional level. Uh, so that is one thing we want to do when designing. And open source collaboration contribution, as I just talked about, we want to make sure that we do this to have. So uh, thank you. That's, that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Thanks.